Good morning, everybody. I hope you had a good evening and uh, hopefully also a good night. I think that those people coming from far away, I hope that now from different time zones that now you have accommodated so that you are ready for yet another inspiring day, hopefully. And who could make so many people meet in early this morning? Well, uh, I understand that yesterday there was a session somewhere in, in, in the building that the star architect is dead. Not quite. And you will meet some of them today. So I'm sure that you are ready for a really exciting session now with uh, Jan Giel and Rob Adams. And to host this session, I'll now hand over the stage to the city architect in Copenhagen, Camilla van Ders. Please. Good morning, all, and welcome to this session where we will be discussing life between buildings and how to build cities for people. And I feel it's a little bit like a, a rock concert here. And I feel like I have the job of introducing Mick Jagger and Paul McCartney to the stage. <laughs> so please, everyone, give a round of applause for Professors Jan Gale and Rob Adams. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So, this is the book it's all about. More than 50 years ago, Jan wrote the seminal book Life Between Buildings in 1971. And in doing so, he became the godfather of a new urban movement, a rediscovery of people in cities, and influenced so many of us, including myself, in that movement. And his cross-disciplinary work has, together with his wife, psychologist Ingrid Gill, formed a new urban theory that cities such as Melbourne has taken up. Uh, and we'll be discussing this over the next hour and a half. Jan has been a researcher, a professor, a thought leader, founder of Gill Architects, and the recipient of so many medals and honors that it will take four pages to lift them, so I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> but to know that we are very happy that you've joined us. Um, and uh, you've worked in almost 250 cities across the globe. That's impressive. And we'll be zooming in on one of those cities uh, a little later. But I know that in your heart, you feel that your books and your publications are maybe some of the most important lessons and legacies. And these books are translated to almost as many languages as the tales of Hans Christian Andersen. Um, so thank you, first of all, for sharing those with all of us. Um, but I'd like to start with you, Jan, and just briefly to tell about the story of how this young architect who started his career in the 50s, and this example from Greenland, looking at buildings, how did you become interested in people and how did the Australian connection begin? The people story I'll return to mm. a little bit later. But the Melbourne story I would love to tell about um, in 1976, I was invited to come to Melbourne to be a visiting professor. And uh, everybody warned me about going to Australia. They said it was extremely conservative and backwards and whatever. Nothing was known about Australia in this part of the world at that time. So I went and had the most fantastic time in my life because there was a fantastic students and at that time I was very interested in housing and we did some enormous exciting studies of the importance of front yards of soft edges in cities and we studied 
residential streets all over Mount Melbourne, and that was a fantastic experience. The best students I've ever, sorry about that, Camilla, <laughs> but uh, the best students I've ever come across, so enthusiastic, so hardworking. It was a fantastic time. We have some of them here, yeah. 76, I was back in 1978, and at that time, you were not, a, you were not even heard of Australia. No, I hadn't been there. And you, I didn't meet you at that time, but I came to fall in love with Melbourne and, and the Australians because I f found very quickly that the values and the humor, especially the humor, was something I could recognize right away. They could understand silly Danish jokes and everything. <laughs> and uh, it was wonderful. So I became half Australian way before you ever set your foot. And, and let's just pause there, and Rob, because ha Jan is hinting at it, you're not a native Australian. No, I was born in Zimbabwe. Yes. And um, I suppose uh, my first uh, trip out of uh, Zimbabwe was in my fourth year at university. I studied at Cape Town University. And uh, we had to, we could travel for six months, but we had to write a report. And uh, because I'd never been out of Africa, I decided to write a report on town planning in Scandinavia in the hill towns of Italy. You had to see the continent. <laughs> and so the first city I visited in Scandinavia was Copenhagen. Mm. I am 25% Dutch, uh, you know, and 25% uh, Norwegian. Uh, the rest. You do speak a little bit of Danish, I know. Oh, you're very not going to do it from the But stage. don't test you me. Do. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, it was that trip that actually turned me on to urban design yeah. because uh, when I looked at how cities were being designed and some of the early ones, Albertslund uh, here in, in Copenhagen, wasn't brilliant and some of the stuff that was happening in Stockholm and Wallingby and places like that, I didn't feel as though I wanted to live there. But then I went down to Italy and suddenly I discovered people. And you know, you relaxed, you sat, you sketched, yeah. you had coffee. And so, in 1975, I went back and studied urban design at Oxford Brooks, and one of the first books I read was Space Between Buildings. And that's where the love affair starts. And then, eventually, you ended in Melbourne, and for 40 years, shaping that city as the city architect and the, the design director of the city of Melbourne. Yep. So having an immense effect on one place where Jan has globally work with so many cities. And I think that's the discussion, yeah. you know, of your friendship and how the global experiences then land in a particular place and how you have made the transformation of this marvelous city yeah. during the last 40 years. Yeah, it's been, I mean, it's been an absolute privilege to work for a city for so long, but also to have guidance. And, uh, you know, what Jan has done for Melbourne is not only talk about how to shape it, but he's gone around the world and promoted it. Yeah, when Jan picture Gell, of you in Melbourne here. Yeah. yeah. When Jan Gell says that uh, Swanson Street carries more pedestrians than Russell Street in London, that means a lot, and people stop and listen. So I think Jan has been the greatest advocate that Melbourne could ever have in terms of promoting that city and, and drawing attention to what we thought was just mm. you know, a small transformation. And holding the mirror. For Holding the, the mirror, yeah. Yes. So let's hear something about this. So, Jan, I'd like to give the floor to you to lead us through a presentation um, about your life, about changing cities for people, and then handing over the, the podium to Rob at the end uh, to share his story of Melbourne. Please. I'll just quote Rob before I start. I think that at one point um, you said, I've had 16 mayors, I've handled them all. <laughs> I think that's because Melbourne is a, is a city which was, in my eyes, has been very much led, not by the politicians, but by a firebrand, an urban designer. We really had a vision. But we'll ha talk more about that later. <laughs> and don't tell the politicians. <laughs> Well, while Jan goes to the stage, the truth is the politicians led this. Mm. You need politicians with vision to change a city. You can't do it as an individual. 
I decided that if I ever was going to speak at UIA, I would start with this one, because forever, wherever we come from, we all work for the same client, the little walking creature, which is made for walking and has the same senses all over the world, the same biological history, and move at slow speeds and are very interested in other people. That's what unites us in UIA. Then we have many different stories to tell. I'll tell about very quickly. I was trained 60, yeah, I was trained in the 50s and I graduated 63 years ago. In the 60s, in the 50s, in the training, we learned to be good modernists. Uh, that the buildings were everything and what was in between was nothing. We was told that it doesn't matter how you place your buildings and what you do because people would be so happy to move into a nice modern flat with running water and a, a, a toilet that they will be happy ever after. Uh, and that that also, uh, the conclusion there was that what really mattered was not how the buildings were, but that was the architecture. What nice pattern it was and how much the aesthetics of the facade influenced. So the only thing which mattered for people's welfare was the architecture with a big A, not the form and the, how that influenced the life. It didn't. <coughs> Then I married a psychologist, and then we had many discussions, and one of them was, why didn't they teach you anything about people while you were in architecture school? And uh, it was not easy, but I had to go back to School of Architecture to spend 40 more years. And I found out that they didn't tell anything about form and life because nothing was known. We had to start really from the bottom. I sat there for 40 years in 200 cities, I think, around the world, including Melbourne, to watch what was, how people used the buildings and the cities. And based on that, I, I summarized it in a number of books. And uh, I realized, especially now when I'm older, that really what matters in life is if you can manage to change the way people think, change the mindset. And I realized that seven books in 41 languages has, has had an influence on the mindset of our profession. And I'm very proud about that now in my mature or ripe age. <laughs> Being this old. I can also clearer see what has happened in these 50, 60 years in the past. There has been in this time three places in the world where <coughs> serious studies were done about how the built form influenced the quality of life. There have been the three schools. One was the New York School. We started out in 61 with Jane Jacobs and her fabulous book, continued with Holly White and with uh, the pub, uh, sorry, um, project for public spaces, Fred Kent and all that. And uh, that's one of the schools. Another school was the Berkeley University School with Alexander, with Alan Jacobs, with Bosselman, with Abelard, with Cooper Marcus. Uh, and the third school was the Copenhagen School. And these three schools were a little bit difficult, different because um, especially in Berkeley, they wrote were books about most everything, but all of them very fine. But in Copenhagen, we wrote all the books, we did all the studies in our hometown. So the University of Copenhagen became one of the schools which consistently looked into what happened in Copenhagen ever since uh, the mid-60s, and, and uh, it carries on today and with Camilla in the in the driver's seat, I'm very proud of that. Um, what has happened and what is really is an explanation about the development of Copenhagen was that this was the first city in the world 
where the life in the city was documented just as carefully as the traffic engineers documented the traffic. And we have a saying, what you count, you care for. And in all the other cities, they counted the traffic. In Copenhagen, we started to count the people and find out where the people were, where they did like to go, where they didn't. All this we pioneered actually here in Copenhagen. And I realized that it came to have quite an influence on the development of Copenhagen. The Copenhagen story, short version, <coughs> is like all other cities um, around the turn of the previous century. It was a peaceful city. People were, it was the spaces where for people, they were moving about. There was one Ford car arriving, no problem. 50 years later, the cars had occupied every space also in this city. It was really awful. They had plans to chase the bicycles home because the bicycles were in the way of, of progress all the time. Um, that was changed with the oil crisis, by the way. In 1962, very much as a pioneer uh, thing, the mayor of Copenhagen closed the main street. He didn't do it for mankind. He did it for the businesses because the customers were chased out of the street by the cars, so he took the cars out. There was great discussion. It would never work, and we were not Italians, and it, it, the climate was too bad in Denmark. They did it anyway, and next year we started to be Italians. Copenhagen looked like any city, but gradually, gradually, one place after the other was transformed. It was a long, rather slow process. Our brilliant traffic engineer who hated traffic, uh, he said that if I remove car parking slowly, he did take 2 to 3% out of the city every year. If I do it slowly and don't tell anybody, nobody will notice, and he did it. So all the squares in Copenhagen, one by one, was turned into people places. All the waterfront streets, which were nice places to park the cars, were turned into people places. It was a long process. <coughs> Some of the things we did in the university was that we followed every step in this, and we were able to prove that the more space for people you provided in the city, the more good quality space, the more people came out to enjoy and to see the city and each other. This had an influence on the policy of Copenhagen, and we have this little wonderful quote from the mayor of planning at that time, without the public life research from the School of Architecture, we as politicians would never have dared to make Copenhagen the most livable city in the world. What you count, you care for. Important in this process were strategies. Again, they come out of the mindset and out of the studies. There was one <coughs> strategy that we will make Copenhagen the best city in the world for people. And they worked on this ever since. They also had another one. We will make Copenhagen the best city in the world for bicycling. And these strategies are very important for shaping the direction of the city. And I think that you see some nice squares here and there and streets, but what really is important that there is a policy, it should be the best city in the world for people. And you can see it in many of the, nearly all the major streets has been transformed. They used to be asphalt. Now there are only two lanes for cars. There are street trees, there are bicycle lanes, there are medians in the middle. And the lower street here is much more safe for everybody. It's much more beautiful, and it can carry just as many cars as the other could because the traffic engineers are more clever now. But the, one of the major things and the best things, I think, of all the things which has happened is the idea of the continuous sidewalks and the continuous bike lanes. That means <coughs> a lot of good things, but Primarily, it means that now my grandchildren from their six, they can walk all the way to school because the sidewalk goes from the door of their, where they live to the door of the school. That is something which I really think is important in a people city. 
There has been in Copenhagen this fabulous development, both outside in the other areas and in the city center, where so much space has been set aside in a long process for people activities. <clears throat> we, because we've studied it, we, we can see some interesting phases. The first phase, 20 years from 60 to 80, was the time where we pushed back the cars and sort of gave the space to the people that was focused on you should be able to walk in your city. But then you started to be tired of walking and you wanted to sit and then the squares were cleared of cars and we had the cafe culture coming in, we had all the benches and we also had made the culture coming back into the city, the festivals, all the events which can happen in a city need space it came in this period, 80 to 2000. The next one is from 2000. And suddenly it was about that people should move and not sit in the car. It was something about the sitting syndrome where we have made city planning so that you sat and sat and sat. Now we should bicycle and skateboard and swim in the harbor. Third phase. Fourth phase, which is running now, is the climate adaptation where districts are turned um, from places where all the basements were full of water into sponge, which should seep up the water when there is a, a cloud burst and keep the water. But all the time when there's no water, it's a much better neighborhood for recreation and for children and for fun. So what have we learned from Copenhagen? For many years, we have known that if you make more roads, you will have more traffic. But in Copenhagen, we early started to realize that if we give good invitations for people, activities, you will have more walking, more public life, and more bicycling. And we have proved it right here. And what happens when you do all these awful things in cities, take away parking lanes, take away driving lanes and parking places, you become rated as the best livable city in the world. Monocle 1913, Monocle 1914, and it goes on and on, but not always, but of course Melbourne is very, very close. I think that's very important, 1930. Then Melbourne sort of disappeared, I couldn't understand it, but this is 22, also in 21, and I also took 23 here because Copenhagen is now number two. I can't understand it, but it's number two. But Melbourne has reappeared. It's just there in the bottom among the most livable cities in the world. Um, I will end with this one, saying that <clears throat> as far as I can see, there is no doubt that Melbourne is the most livable city in the southern half of the earth and if you can't find a place to live in Copenhagen which is difficult I will suggest that you move to Melbourne it's well worth the journey and now Rob Adams will tell you why Melbourne has become such a nice city Melbourne is like <laughs> Melbourne has become like Paris but the weather is much better Thanks, Jan. <clears throat> Thank you, Jan. Um, and uh, yes, if you want to move to Melbourne. I'm going to talk to you about 40 years of transformation in Melbourne. Melbourne in the 1980s was a city that was failing. Uh, there were press articles that uh, said it was failing. And the politicians of the day decided to make that a turnaround strategy. It's when I came to Melbourne in 1983 and I was one of five people who helped write the strategy for Melbourne. And what we were doing was looking at how we needed to change or transform a city to make it a livable city. And some of the clues are there. You needed to have your own city, local character. You needed density, you needed mixed use. You needed a high quality public realm, that space between buildings that Jan writes so eloquently about. And you needed to be able to use that city in so many ways. 
But you needed to bring the public with you, and you needed to build, bring all the other agencies with you. The city itself had very little power. The state runs the planning system, and therefore our, our job is advocacy and implementation. And if you can do those things, you're going to get economic vitality, social cohesion, and sustainability. And that really has been the objective for the last 40 years. I'm going to talk to you about this through 10 initiatives. And it'll be very brief. Each one of those could be a lecture in itself. The first is local character. Don't copy others. Build your own city with your own characteristics. It's going to be far easier and far more successful. So we looked at Melbourne and said, what is that characteristic? And I can't talk about them all. But the built form, for instance, was an unusual one. We had blocks that were 200 meters by 200 meters, subdivided to 100 meters by 200 meters by a 10 meter street that went through those. And what that created was lanes and arcades. And our job, a bit like Copenhagen, was to take the cars out of those lanes and arcades and bring the people back to them. This was the block. You can see it there. It was subdivided in the 19th century to make money. It wasn't a planning initiative, it was actually a commercial activity. And in subdividing that block, you needed lanes and arcades to penetrate it. In the 20th century, developers started to consolidate, and that big lump that you can see down in that bottom slide is an internalized shopping center with only one entrance. And if you do that to your city often enough, it's the middle slide, you kill your city. So we decided we wouldn't do that. We'd actually respect the street, which is your biggest public space, and we'd start to make people recognize and respect that street. And that became our policy around lanes. Our lanes had been used by people, but what we allowed people is to start doing commercial activity where you could stop, have a coffee, and have a meal. The next major thing we needed to do was bring back a density to the downtown. Nobody lived in the downtown in the 1980s. There were 683 residential units. And what we needed to do was to, in fact, have a population that was there 24-7. The vision for the city was to be a 24-hour city that looked and felt like Melbourne. Postcode 3000 was a project that looked in the late 80s after the crash in the property market and the overbuilding of office buildings to how we could convert office buildings to residential to bring people back to the central city. Something that a post-COVID city is now looking at. How do you, in fact, use that redundant uh, accommodation that you have? As I said, we had 685 dwellings. Each of those dots represents five dwellings. And what we did over time was encourage people to come back and live in the city. 2016, we had 41,000. We've got 65,000 people living in that central city. If you do that to a city, you fundamentally change it. You have people living there, using it 24 hours a day. The economy of that city changes. The rate structure improves. People are paying less rates because there are more people to pay that rate. So that encourages business and people to come back to that city. The next thing we had to do was look at active movement. And a bit like Jan mentioned, if we had said, because we don't control the roads, we only control some of the local roads, if we said we were going to take space away from the cars, we would have been stopped by the state government. So we just subtly, one of the first projects we did was widen a footpath by a meter and plant 10 trees. My granddaughter says that all I do is widen footpaths and plant trees. And if that's all I do, I'm very happy. So we started to do this project, Greater Green. And what Greater Green meant is we started to take space away from the cars and give it to pedestrians in public open space. Over time, and there's a slide, unfortunately, that's fallen out of here, we took out 80 hectares of space, asphalt, from the central city and turned it over to pedestrians, bikes, and uh, public open space. You can see some of the interventions in that slide with the red. And it was a case, simply as you can see here on Ligon Street, one of our streets with an Italian community, we widened that footpath, we put a median down the middle, we gave people a place to sit and have coffee. In 1992, which was a seminal year for us, it was the start of postcode 3000, we closed the main street through Melbourne. Not completely, we closed it to make it mainly pedestrian, public transport, uh, and, and, and bicycle traffic. And there was still some access for uh, traffic because you needed to service the, the, the retail. People said that it would kill the city. You can see what it looked like 
on, on the left-hand side there, and on the right, we'd planted 100 trees and we'd extended the footpaths. What happened was people came back. And you can see from eight, uh, 10 in the morning to 6 at night, it had 12,800, it went to 47,000. We've now got 65,000 people that use that street every day. It is one of the busiest streets in Australia, and it's been written up by Bloomberg in, in his book on streets as a successful street for not only public transport, but for people. The next thing, and this is uh, you know, something that Jan really has advocated for so long, is the space between buildings needed to be good. 80% of the space, public space in any city is made up of roads or streets. So quid pro quo, if you design a good street, you'll design a good city. And it is as simple as that. So when you walk around a city, when you walked here today, did you find a good street? I would say no. Because you couldn't activate the buildings, you couldn't see into them, there were no trees. You can't afford to do that in cities. You need to have good streets that people enjoy and walk to. We started doing this incrementally and after nine years, I seem to have lost my audio. Can you give me the audio on the desk? Hello? <laughs> I'll try and shout, but I'm not. All right, I think we're back on. I can tell you that's a relief. When I was doing a TED talk, the slides failed. That's frightening. I was standing there saying, give me the next slide. What we were doing was we were changing our city in small steps incrementally. And when we got to 1992, uh, one of the people working with me said, Rob, you know what? Nobody's going to ever know what we've done here because it's like warming up a bath. And I said, well, what do we do about this? And he said, there's this guy, Jan Gell. We need to get Jan to help us count so we care for it. And we, we phoned up Jan, um, and I often make phone calls like this and said, would you come and work with us? And Jan, in his very obliging way, came down. And we started to record the changes that were happening in Melbourne. We did two studies. This is the second one in 2004. And these were the results that came out. This was an absolute game changer for Melbourne because nobody believes you're fixing up your city because it happens slowly. But if you can quote those figures, and I'm not going to read them, and you can get Jan to basically say that Swanson Street is carrying more uh, pedestrians than Regent Street in London, suddenly the newspapers stop and listen and the public start, uh, starts to listen. The next thing we had to do was adapt and I suppose I'll go back to that uh, if I can, if that takes me back. No, not to worry. Um, the next thing we had to do was adapt uh, the urban landscape. Climate change hit us seriously in 2000. Uh, we had 11 years of low rainfall. Everybody said it was a long drought. It was climate change. We stood to lose most of our street trees. We had a, a, a horrific day, 46.4 degrees, 173 people died in the fires, 374 died of heat exhaustion. What we needed to do was have a strategy to look after our trees. So we wrote an urban forest strategy. And one of the secrets of public consultation is be careful the questions you ask. 
If you ask people what trees they want, that's a, a circular argument. If you ask them whether you want to go from 22% canopy cover to 40% canopy cover, that is a useful discussion. So we asked about canopy cover, we asked about diversity, we asked about health of the vegetation, and how do we get a, a moisture into the soil. And we started to plant trees seriously. We'd already been planting trees, but we started to plant them. The next strategy was, if you're gonna plant trees, you need to have water. We're in the driest continent on the planet, and our rainfall was dropping. It was coming in large bursts far apart. So how do you capture water? And the cheapest way to store water is in the soil. So we started to store, uh, store it in the soil. The water runs off the street into a tree pit. The last resort is to put it in a pipe. Keep it in the soil. We started to, every, every one of those blue lines is a median line like this. We blessed with wide streets. We dug up the middle of the street where there were no services and we planted trees and we put grass so you could get an impermeable surface. We started to build water tanks that could capture the overland flow when we had uh, peak events. And when we weren't having peak events, we used that water to look after our parks and gardens. This is an example of a depot. I had the parks and gardens with me for 10 years. We took the depot, rationalized it, made it smaller, and put in a 5, 000, uh, 5 million liter tank. We gave back 4,000 square meters of parkland, a visitor center, and modernized the depot. The next strategy was to look at greening our buildings. In 2000, the mayor said to me, we're putting in trees, we're widening footpaths, we've got, got bicycles coming, what do we do next? The buildings are the biggest contributor in our city to greenhouse gases. And I said, we need to build the most advanced uh, office building. And he said, all right, let's do it. And this is CH2, it, won the, it was the first six star green star building. Not only does it save its, its energy, uh, it also creates a good indoor environment. The air comes up through the floor and disappears through the ceiling. It cools itself by opening the windows and using thermal, thermal mass in summer. This was the only building people were happy to go back into with COVID because they were sitting in a tube of fresh air that this warm body in their computer created as the air went past them. The next initiative was to say, well, if we're doing all that, then we need to, in fact, have more renewable energy and we need to be able to store it. And we started a thing called MREP, where we, we got 10 big companies together and we built a wind farm. So all of the energy for our operations, the operations of those organizations, was now green energy. And these were the organizations we, we, we got. You can't read them, but they're universities, they're the post office, they're the zoo, all of those big organizations that use a lot of energy. The first uh, wind farm generated 88 gigawatt hours. We did it again, and the second one is generating uh, 110 gigawatt hours. We're continuing this program of building large wind farms to, in fact, generate green energy. We're also starting to put um, batteries, neighborhood batteries around, so people can, in fact, feed into the battery and draw it out when they need it. They don't need to have a battery in their, in their house. The biggest thing that makes government a success is partnerships. Value your partnerships, your partnerships with the politicians, your partnerships with the internal departments, the partnerships with the developers, and the partnerships with the other levels of government. What we've done is we're not a rich council, we didn't have much land. I, I envy the Scandinavian countries. Gothenburg had 40% of the land when I went there about 10, 15 years ago. We didn't have much, so every piece of land we had, we had to make better. And these are some of the projects. I'll talk to you about one. This is one that's just being completed at the moment. This was about fixing up our market uh, in the central city to bring people back to the market because it was suffering. And what we did is we had a car park. And one of the things we said in the 1980s, if you've got a surface level car park, you need to get rid of it. And one of the last remaining ones is up by the market. It has 720 cars parked on asphalt. So we decided to buy a site to build a much smaller car park underground to create an open space out of the uh, 1.7 hectare of a car park that we had, to put in community facilities, a, a library, retail, and make, make it a six star, uh, green star project. This is the project here. And when the politicians say, but how does this stack up financially? The answer is, and you can't read it, unfortunately there, Whatever you pay, the 86 million for the site and the 70 million for the community facilities and the parking and all of those, what you get back is new community facilities which you had to build anyway. 
you get to sell half of the land to the developer who owns that blue section above ground, we own the green section. You get to put in affordable housing and we talk the government out of 7.5 million to help pay for the land value of that uh, uh, affordable housing. You get a residual value that you own and then you get a $118 million value on the open space. Now that's only a value that the, the, the government can recognize. And suddenly your financials look very good. And the development, if it's a good brief, you can see there with the yellow, has lanes and arcades, it has no back of house, all of those are active frontages. So we keep on doing that. We've just done another site close to this where we talk the government out of the site for no money at all. And we've just sold it for 200 million and control the development and use that money to reinvest in our market. I'll end by saying all of that's fine in the central city, but the Australian cities are failing. Every one of the capital cities of Australia is failing. They're failing because what happens is people put, or governments, put their new populations on the fringe. They put them an hour and a half away from where they need to work. And they put them there with no public transport and no infrastructure. That's not the way to build a city. So 2010, we looked at what you could do to change that. How could you change that? These are the studies coming out of Griffiths University that showed how people were suffering. If it's getting more orange, those people are suffering on the fringe of Melbourne. And that's every capital city in Melbourne. We looked at where our public transport is, and none of this is new. We put our population there. You could put 860,000 people around a railway station in walking distance of that railway station. We've got many of those. They're the white dots. You could look at the, the, the car, uh, corridors, the tram corridors, and without going into the neighboring areas and disrupting those, you could put your population there. That's another 3% of the metro area. And you could, on those areas, and we did the sums, you could put 2.5 million people along those, and you weren't building higher than five to eight stories. This was the fabric. You can see it. You can see the city in the distance. You can see the expensive tracks in the, in the road, and you can see the fabric adjacent. So what if you build five to eight stories? Fortunately, the government hasn't legislated for that to happen, but the developers have recognized the opportunity, and this is what's happening in Melbourne today. It's the thing that makes me excited that if you can get the message across, it's not always the governments that will change it. It's your other partners, the developers. So it's like this. You put the development... I need the next slide. <laughs> it's gone right through. Not to worry. The elevator pitch is that 7.5% of the city with greater density, not higher than five to eight storeys, will save you $550 billion in infrastructure costs. That's how the Australian cities need to develop if we're going to meet the challenge of climate change. I've given some references there, and I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob and Jan, for sharing those lessons. And I've known you for 20 years. We shared an office. We shared an office. <laughs> I worked for you. You were my client. Uh, and I've known Jan for 25 plus years. And you guys have known each other for 30 years. So for a minute, let's forget these guys. So we're just three old friends. Yeah. And we're going to talk because these these numbers and these achievements are so impressive and so transformative. But I'm sure behind that, there are also mistakes and things looking back that you would maybe have done differently. So forget them. They won't tell. <laughs> <laughs> Can you share, looking back at these transformations, what are the pivotal moments? Where could it have gone wrong? And where would you maybe go back and, and tweak the development? Yen. <clears throat> Working for, yeah, you told my life is in two parts, the research and, it, and, and um, writer part, and the, the, the part where we applied what we have learned to various cities all over the place. And in this connection, of course, I worked with many cities, and some has been blatant successes, and some have been not successes at all. And I've come to realize how 
important the, the human factor is, if there is a very good mayor like in Sydney, she can move the city fantastically. If, by the way, there is a good city architect, he can do quite a few things. And um, I think that my worst case is London. We did a fantastic study. There was a very good mayor called Ken Livingston. He lifted the study here and said, we will do it, we will do it. And then they elected Boris Johnson as mayor <laughs> and nothing happened. They still have some committees discussing if this 20 years old study should actually be used if to get forward. And nothing much is happening. A little bit has happened. In so, very important, the human factor, that there are drivers. In Copenhagen, there have been fine drivers. The city architect and the city engineer and some of the, uh, actually quite a few of the mayors have worked excellently together towards a common vision of making a city for people, a city for bicycles, and, and trying to make it friendly um, people, uh, in inviting people. So, um, and also, I mentioned before that you have mentioned that you had 16 mayors and you've handled them all. I met several of them. I remember one of them, he came, he had a platform saying, I will get this, the cars back in Main Street, Melbourne. He was elected and three months later he came out and said, I was completely wrong. <laughs> We, say, we take the last cars out of Main Street. He has had a talk with, with Rob about what cities were about. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that is a very important factor. So um, if the politics uh, is, is slow, like in London, it can go very stale. If the politics, politicians have visions also, we can move. But it's about bravery, right? Action on <coughs> these visions. Yeah, right. I, look, I think uh, for me, just to give a context, when I was asked in 1985 if I'd stay on um, and try and make that strategy work, I said on one condition, and that is that you need, need to have a practicing architectural practice, city architect's office in government, mm. only because you can then hire the best people to come and work because they're doing projects. Now, the trouble with doing projects is you make mistakes. And so the one thing I said to my staff when they joined, you will make mistakes. I've made mistakes. The best thing you could do is not try and hide the mistakes because mm. we can help you. So the only mistake you'll make is if you don't tell us you've made a mistake. And we've made plenty. And uh, the thing that I like about uh, the city of Melbourne and the politicians is they allow you to make mistakes. Mm. Uh, and. Uh, We've, the biggest mistake we made was with the most successful project, Postcode 3000. If you get so focused on bringing people back and that becomes a, an obsession, sometimes you don't recognize that you're pushing some people out. Mm. And affordability becomes an issue. As I said, we don't have full planning control. Uh, the state po politicians got very excited about you know, the jobs that were being generated off the new buildings, they changed the built form controls. So every site in Melbourne became a development site mm. and we started to lose heritage. So I think uh, you need to be observant, um, you know, in those things. The other thing is you need to be brave enough to speak about your mistakes. And when we built CH2 and designed it, and we designed it with a, a colleague of mine from Zimbabwe, Mick Pearce, and uh, Design Inc. And, and a whole team of people. We started to say, we tried many things. We started to tell people what wasn't working. What was working was important, but what wasn't working was also important. That we were trying to take black water out of the sewer and purify it at a building scale. It doesn't work at a building scale. It needs to be a precinct scale. Mm. You don't have the building managers that can actually control it at a building scale. So the last article written about CH2, which was about a year ago, talks about all those mistakes and how you can actually rectify that. Because only by talking about your mistakes can you get people to not make those mistakes themselves. So that's been the experience we've had. And I think that's such an important lesson because you know all of the fa flashy images that yep. we always share with each other 
uh, it's, it's really what you're describing is the process and yep. that it's not a linear movement, no. but it's kind of towards the goal. It is. And then you're moving and adjusting yep. your process and your strategies as you go along. Yeah. And every project is just not one project. I mean, the project I showed in the park, yeah. that wasn't about building a new depot. And it wasn't just about saving water. It was about giving back public space. So you can approach projects, and so often I see they sort of single focused. You can get this multiple focus where you can get many outcomes. And in doing that, you build the partnerships with different agencies. Mm -hmm. And quite often we look at the different agencies and say, they can do this piece and we can do this piece. And the politicians, you can have a green politician here, you can have a social po politician here, and you can have a, you know, a liberal pot politician over here. They all find their place, and that's the secret, that you can keep with the momentum going with those projects through the city. And so I started saying that you were Paul McCartney and Mick Jagger. You can discuss who is which. But to, to quote Paul McCartney, it's about having a little help from my friends and establishing those partnerships, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's the most valuable partnership we've had with yeah. Jan. And, and that friendship and the partnership between you. You said Yan was like a mirror, yeah. coming, maybe telling the truths that were difficult to see when you were in the city, in the development. That's right. Yeah. I mean, Jan knows it. I mean, uh, for many years, you know, the fabulous work he was doing, people in Copenhagen didn't recognize it. Mm. I was at the university when the institute he set up on his retirement, they closed down. That was a very sad day for me. Yes. Because what it said is you don't recognize how good that is, what that person is doing. And, you know, so in your own city, you're not always seen uh, as a prophet. You need others to, you know, come and shine lights on it. And Jan, you know, I get a sense of humor, you see. <laughs> he could come and actually talk to mayors and talk to politicians. Sure. But, but sometimes people are very influential, as you say, outside the cities and globally. And I'd, I'd like to turn, I know, Jan, to one of your heroines, Jane Jacobs, because she had a similar role in her time. And this famous battle between Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses to get the, the cars out of uh, Manhattan and to save uh, the village. Um, and hearing your stories, both of you, there's something about this battle against the car that is predominant. So, Jan, you've showed us this transformation in your mind how do we do this? How do we move forward? Because it seems to be a theme from Jacobs and, and Robert Moses right to today that we're still baffling in cities. Certainly, certainly. And uh, I, I would, I'm also worried about uh, Copenhagen has so many good things doing, mm. but something we cannot control in the city is that while we have done a lot of good things in the last 10 years, the people have bought 25% more cars. So you do all these calming and, and removing parking and whatever with one hand, and you can't control the government lowering the car taxes and people buying more cars. And then all you do here is upset by this other thing. I was very shocked the other day to hear um, an American coming into the city saying, oh my dear, is this Copenhagen? It looks like Chicago. Mm. And I'm sure that we will have to be very, very um, radical. And, and I really have a vision that having a nice city for people, you could also start to make restrictions on car driving. If you are making Lunederholm, then for God's sake, that will be a place with no private cars allowed only shared cars. I think that in the city centers, you should only have shared cars. If you want to have one or two cars out to the suburbs you go, uh, I think we should actually make a, a, have a vision of, of benefiting from good city planning and not trying to make suburban city planning into the city. Mm. And uh, that is still very difficult for the politicians to handle and also for many people to handle. But I have seen so many changes in my time mm. that I believe that we can start to um, 
two more here. There's also this vision that when we have electric cars uh, with no drivers, we, we have no problems no more. It depends on how many we have, I can tell they you. They take up the same space, don't yeah, they, in the streets? Yeah, because the major problem yeah. is all the space these vehicles take, and that is a not a smart way of getting around in a dense city, neither in Melbourne nor here. And that has not really yet come through in any city, and Copenhagen could be, of course, the pioneer in this area if there is some courage among the politicians here and they can see the picture that we again could be a place where you will see to mm. this place. This is how you can do in dense cities. Mm. I think uh, in many cases, um, you know, it's about trying to get that balance. Mm. We're never going to get rid of all the cars and, and neither do I think we knew to, do we need to. Um, but how do you get the balance? How do you make sure that, you know, everybody's getting their equal share? And, uh, you know, unfortunately, still in Melbourne, you're seeing freeways widened. Uh, and we know the stupidity of that. Jan spoke about mm -hmm. it earlier. We're just bringing more traffic. So, I mean, our strategy is to, and, and the way we've kept some sort of calm in this debate is to say, um, we're just trying to redress the balance. So we'll keep the car in. But we will actually widen the footpath and we'll put in a bike lane. So during COVID, we put 40 kilometers of bike lanes down through the central city. We already had a good system. And the moment COVID ended and people got back in their cars, they said, you need to take them out. And the politicians said, no. Hello. <coughs> so. Hello. There. Okay. There, there we you go. are. Ooh, very loud now. I'm trying not to take this personally. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, let, let's. Let's. I really hate talking about cars because it's not about creating a city for cars, but for people, as you stress. But Jan, you mentioned earlier that the currency is data and counting and knowing what, about what we're doing what we're doing in cities and the one th currency which i find at least in copenhagen and many other cities is is predominant right now is the co2 number and that seems to sometimes be the argument for having electric cars then it doesn't matter because we're not using the same amount of co2 so everyone is very focused on reducing this number well, for obvious reasons yeah. which we're all here to discuss in this congress but i'd like i'd like to say or ask you in your minds what are the other things we should focus on what are the other burning issues in cities that that you think are important to work with in the future the climate yes the co2 numbers but mm. but that's the data right yeah. it's what is actually the benefits rob you're talking about the multi-layering of, of benefits on top of each other. Yeah. Well, to me, uh, we all know it, over 50% of the population now live in cities. That is a, a stunningly good figure, and it's better as it gets higher mm -hmm. in percentage. It's better for many reasons. Uh, I've often said it, and it might sound uh, insensitive, um, cities are the best birth control because people get opportunities <laughs> and therefore families get smaller. Mm. If we know that cities are where most of us are going to live and we know the problem is climate change, then those places have to become livable and that livability has to be able to be done, as Jan pointed out with his first slide, by walking. Mm. So, you know, we, we, can, we can argue about, you know, certain things and all the things we should be doing, and we've been doing some of them. But unless we get to cities that are compact, mixed use, and walkable, where, you know, in COVID, I, I'm lucky to live in a good area in Melbourne. 
They, they confined us for 265 days and said you couldn't go mo more than five kilometers from your house. I could do everything I wanted to do. So All it's this city. concept we've seen in Paris of the 15 That's minutes. Right. 15 city. minutes, yeah. Yes. yeah. That's what all cities have to have. You can't expect someone to pay $24,200 a year for a motor car to get a pint of milk. Mm. That doesn't work. So it's about looking at people, cost of living, you know, walkable cities. And if we do that, we su can succeed. The CO2 will come down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, of course, have go gone around and collected arguments and I'm saying that it's so important that we make city planning with people in mind to, to a much to an increasing degree. And there are some, there are a number of good reasons why it's more important now. Um, of course, there's this tendency that let's lean back and wait for some technical gimmicks. Mm. Let's wait for the smart city. Let's make for the electric car and all the problems will be solved. Uh, and if not, we can have drones and helicopters. So, but all this is very expensive and it will never reach uh, darker and further away places uh, until a very, very distant future. So I say count on make cities for people because that's a very good strategy, always were, and you are mentioning some arguments about it. I'll mention some more, uh, of course, we always had public spaces. We always, we can meet through the screens and the telephones, but in the public space, you can see your society, your neighbors. It's, uh, it's spontaneous and, and it's entertaining. And we always loved to see each other. And at, at some time in the motor time and in the modernist time, they forgot about it. but. Meeting other people is very important and having spaces where this can happen naturally in the course of your daily day is very important. But then, of course, the more you walk and bicycle, the better it will be for the climate. And also walking and bicycling is a very, very important precondition for having a smarter public transportation. Then there are two new uh, drivers, I think. One is that the doctors increasingly say make cities so that people walk and bicycle as uh, one hour a day. They will live much longer and they will be much cheaper for health system. So make f uh, stop the, the sitting syndrome and make sure that people move. And then there's one fantastic big factor which we have hardly started to talk about, that about a quarter of all the people who live in cities are now elderly people who have retired. How do we make wonderful cities for mm -hmm. elderly people um, where they can spend 10, 15, 20 years in great style yeah. and be healthy? I know personally because my doctor always said, try to do 10,000 steps a day yeah. to keep the doctor away. Where should I do these 10,000 steps if it wasn't in a nice yeah. city and a nice place? So, and this about making cities where it's good for people to walk. And I take in bicycling also, it's a sort of fast walking. Um, <laughs> if we can make cities which is really inviting for these activities, then it's, it's, it's very low cost in infrastructure and it can be applied, it will help every level in this in this in the in the city from the children to the old people and it is can be applied to all cities in the world regardless of economy actually i see it as a more clever strategy in developing countries than anywhere else because that can make people mobile we saw it in bogota how mm. penelosa worked on yeah. making the least fortunate people more mobile by walking and biking and going by bus so that they could earn a family living instead of selling cigarette lighters to each other. Uh, so I really see that this age old thing about that we are walking animal and we made the cities to come together and mm -hmm. develop our culture. I see this as, as important now as ever 
and that it should be a strategy which could be applied to all parts of the world and not only to Silicon Valley and surrounding. So and it's sort of a, a rediscovery. So in the, the 30s, 40s, 50s, the whole functionalist movement mm -hmm. after Kobushi, that was also <coughs> about health in cities due to other yeah. circumstances. And Rob, you mentioned COVID. And of course, yeah. that has you know, uh, challenged how we think about cities. And this concept from Paris of the 15 million city has grown since, yeah. since that. Uh, and at least in Copenhagen, we saw so many people now flocking to the streets, doing exercise, meeting, moving, walking. And so the revival of a new urban culture, maybe, based on that. It, it is. And <coughs> I think I've just picked a point that Jan said. It's very hard to tell people where and how to live. Mm. I mean, that's just the hardest conversation you're ever going to have. They do it for so many reasons. But if you can have a narrative around and Billy Giles Corte in Melbourne did a study that actually showed that if you lived where you were car orientated, you were more likely to have a heart attack than if you lived in the downtown mm. because you didn't walk. And so those are easier debates to have about you know what your quality of life is. But COVID has actually given us a real opportunity. What it's done is first of all shown us that we don't have to be tied to eight to five, five days a week work. And there's a downside to that because it could become seven days a week work because you're working from home sometimes. Mm. But what it has done is it's transferred the economy in our cities. So people who have to drive for an hour and a half to come to the central city to work are now only doing that for three days. And they are now spending money in their local area. And the local area they want to make better. Mm. So in Melbourne's case, all of those white dots that I showed you hopefully will become better pieces of city. Mm. And people will feel that they can actually live locally and maybe only commute for two or three days a, a week. I think that's a really positive thing. The other thing is they've got more disposable income because they're not having to run a car mm. for two days a week. So what we've found is people are coming to the central city in the evening and over the weekend. The central city has become the place where you get experience, not just go to work. So we're seeing our cities go through this transition of what does post-COVID mean? I wish the one thing that I observed was that people got out of their cars, had continued, but they haven't. They've got back into mm. their cars. So that challenge still faces us. But I think there are lessons there that we could pick up on. And I know, Jan, that you've been very involved in the um, rural or smaller cities in Denmark as well and, and other places to talk about this transition from you know, our, our traditional uh, view of the downtown and the main street as a commercial area to something new and different. Could you tell us about that paradigm shift? Oh, yes. Um, <coughs> we have in many Danish cities, including Copenhagen, uh, the um, empty street syndrome where the shops go down and mm -hmm. old-fashioned, uh, the old traditional trades are not there no more, no clock maker, no, uh, a number of, of, of traditional shops are gone and they will not come back. And we have, especially in the Danish provincial cities, we have really many struggling streets where the downtown is sort of dying. I've seen that in America 20, 40 years ago and um, we will have to address this. And I think that public space is so important that we have for, we have certainly to maintain the good public spaces in every city. A city should have a heart. There should be a place where you put the Christmas tree and where you have the, the Christmas decoration and where you have the meetings and your gatherings and the parties, whatever. Yeah. You need the public space. You cannot just, and we have been lucky that the commerce has driven these streets in all these years. They're struggling now. And I think that the biggest employer in Denmark, which is the public, should be much more active in the public domain, in the city centers, and move um, citizen services and night schools and music schools and whatever into city buildings mm. where they are now scattered, where it could be cheap or whatever. But I think they should take 
the responsibility and go in because many of these things related to leisure time are extremely active mm. as opposed to the clockmaker who has not much to do anymore. So uh, that the cities should be much more active and realize that a public space could be lined also with public entities and that the city could maintain, partake in running the good public spaces. I think that's such an important point because um, one of the things that if you look at cities is we're not utilizing them to the maximum in terms of the infrastructure. Mm. That, that report I spoke about that we did in 2010 came out of going back to Cape Town University 40 years after I left and noticing that they had three times the number of students on the campus and they'd only built one building. And I asked the question, you know, every other university when I went around in 1969 was expanding, the baby boomers were coming. Mm. How come your university has just stayed the same size but you've trebled your students? And they said we asked a different question. The question we asked is how well are we using the stuff we've already got? And lecture theatres were 17.5% of the time. Mm. So they re-timetabled. We have got so much space in our cities that we are underutilizing. You know, we're building houses, particularly in Australia, with too many bedrooms, double living rooms, God knows what. And we spend no time in those spaces. You know, many people are commuting to town. You know, they go and sleep in one room at night. Yeah. So how do we take all that space and reprogram it? Because that will bring back the energy and give the opportunity to people. So when I go down in Copenhagen and I can go into shop and I can see someone blowing glass in the shop, that excites me because people get excited about the process. How do we illustrate the process of the city and make it visible to people so it becomes exciting? And how do we utilize all the empty space that's available at night? Offices could be universities at night. And what you're saying is about uh, densification, uh, reuse of resources, yep. and not building as much. That's right. Because we need to be better at using the buildings we already have. I mean, that figure of 550 billion means you didn't have to build more public transport if you put your population on the public transport. Yeah. You, know, you didn't have to lay any more lines. And now you're getting things like the trackless tram that Peter Newman, who Jan introduced me to in Western Australia, is working on where trams are now able to be put in the city at a tenth of the cost mm. of the normal tram. What does that do to change the dynamics of cities and bring people you know, close to public transport, close to what they need as they expand? And very inspired by, by Bogota, like That's right. Mentioned. Well, Bogota did it. But yeah. Bus rapid trains yeah. in that case. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's imp I would like to um, uh, work a little bit more on something you told about. Because as far as I can see, from Melbourne, we have one of the few good takes on what we can do for the poor suburbs of single family houses endlessly going to the horizon. They are all made uh, in the last 50, 60 years based on the good idea of the strong nuclear family, which is not so strong no more, and cheap gasoline and endless resources. And we don't have the cheap gasoline endless resources anymore. And the idea from Melbourne that don't, do in, don't take in any more land, but we can fit in two, three million extra people in the land we have yep. and, and use the transport lines, build up not more than seven stories. And that's what you call linear Barcelona because Barcelona is bloody dense but it's only seven story high. That means they can see Barcelona from their windows. Yep. Up there, they are part of the, uh, the airline system and they can only see the planes landing in the airport up from up there. But seven stories is all right and keeping it that way and showing, I think you, you mentioned at some point that something like 10 or 13 percent of the single family houses must go to make room for this new development. But the 87 other people will have less than three, 400 meters mm -hmm. to services so that it's a way of saving the suburbs. We have had no plans for saving suburbs. 
we have endless suburbs, endless use of gasoline, we have endless loneliness. In Denmark, we have a, a national association for loneliness because it's a major problem now. People sitting one or one and one and one in too much space. And all this is part of a new world. Mm. And we, I do think that being more people-oriented will also help in that area. And this linear Barcelona plan in, in, in Melbourne is, as far as I can see, one of the best takes I've seen worldwide on how to save the suburbs, how to prevent further sprawl and further spreading out in the landscape. And I think it's very interesting to see that you have actually not only conceived the plan, but also started to realize it in parts of Melbourne. Yeah, I think, I think the, the plan is important for a number of ways. It gives a strategy about how you change the, the, the structure of a city, and, and that's important. But uh, I get a lot of criticism by saying, but you're leaving the suburbs alone. And that's a purposeful action. Because if 92.5% of the people are not going to be affected in their houses, and their strategy is to put solar panels on their roofs, plant trees, and collect water, and turn themselves into the green wedges of the city, then that's far more important for the city than actually ma making them stay awake at night, worrying about whether they're going to get something in their backyard. Mm. And so it's a political message as much as a, a, a city structural message. And I think that's the important thing. You know, we, Quite often we put out strategies that are, are sound, but they are politically difficult to put in place. You've got to leave the politicians with somewhere to go to basically say, you know, 7.5% of a city is not difficult to change. And most of that 7.5% isn't houses. You saw, it's, you know, it's old Streets. car repair and, and things like that. Yeah. A lot of which are, are dying as businesses. So if you can reposition a city like that, um, people will come with you. And if their aim and they feel they're part of the contribution towards climate change by putting on solar panels and planting trees and collecting water, then you've, you've got a, a, a body or an, and dynamic behind you that will help change the city. Australian governments haven't got there yet, mm. but our new prime minister was head of infrastructure and he gets it. And I'm hopeful that you know, we'll go forward with strategies similar to that. And so you've both mentioned Barcelona and this year Copenhagen is the world capital of architecture, you know, nominated by UNESCO. And uh, yesterday, we learned that Barcelona will have the honor in three years for the next Congress. And um, the density in, in Barcelona is 16,000 people per square meter yeah. and only 7,000 per square meter in my native town of Copenhagen. So there's so many lessons we can learn from that city. Yeah. And, you know, this knowledge of building all the time cities onto each other. Yeah. I think the biggest lesson you learn from Barcelona goes back to Seda. Yeah. When he laid out, you know, the post-medieval city, pattern. Yes. he only did about a half a dozen things. He said the buildings will be seven stories, the streets will be this wide, we'll cut off the corner, you'll have a central courtyard. We make the process of designing cities far too complicated. I don't know why we do that, why we actually have multiple documents and diagrams and everything, they are quite simple. They need a density, they need mixed use, they need good connectivity, they need a high quality public realm. Seda understood that. He wasn't an architect, he was an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think that um, there's a reason to be a little bit worried because, uh, Rob, you are retiring from the city of Melbourne. I've got a far more demanding yeah, partner, yeah, my we'll daughter. Return to that. But <laughs> I'm a little bit worried, of course, for the sake of Melbourne. But also, I'm worried. You, I said that Melbourne by far was the best city in the Southern yeah. Hemisphere. Yeah. But I've seen that an interesting process in your neighboring city of Sydney. And that's another story because they have a mayor who is very strong mm. and who has gone out four elections in a row and say, I want to s make a city for people and a green city 
so vote for me and she got lots of votes and every time she got more votes and that shows that it could be led by the technicians and the professionals or it could be led by by good pro uh, politicians and i really am impressed with it took a long time to get moving because of the the usual bigotry in australia between city and state the state was afraid that the mayor should be premier of the state so they tried to subdue the cities yeah. all this stuff but now sydney has really started along and there's many things to see from 16 years of one mayor who really have a strong vision of making a people yep. city and a green city and with you retiring there and she's still up there i'm a little bit worried no there's no need for worry I'm, I'm, no I'm, let, let me worry. continue <laughs> with that for the last few minutes of our session because um it's fair to say that you are both of an experienced age. <laughs> Thank you. As, <laughs> as McCartney would say when I'm 64, <laughs> and you have both passed that age. Um, and uh, it's also said that, that architects are not really good architects until they're past the age of 80, because it takes a lifelong, <laughs> you know, <laughs> learning uh, into the complexity of, of forming cities and buildings. Um, in this next phases of your lives, and I think to me as a midlife architect, it's, uh, it's very reassuring to see that there is a long life and a long active career as and an architect. And the best is to come. Exactly. So tell us in the last few minutes, what are you up to now? What are you guys doing Let's for the next you're doing. couple All of right. years? Um, I took the decision uh, two and a half years ago uh, that there needs to be a succession plan. Mm. The worst thing you could do is just to go on and then it stops. So we've been putting in place a succession plan and I've got a really excellent person running the design, Jocelyn Chu, and she has been there now for about two and a half years and there's an, a good general manager as well who understands the nature of what we've been trying to do. And, and, and it's about getting the stuff on the ground, not writing the reports. So. I've slowly over that two and a half years, and I finish in September, seen this transition happen. And the best news I heard today is we have a new CEO who has been the deputy for some years, a female, Alison Layton, who is excellent. She's an engineer, she gets it, she's good with people. And people are the clue to good government. You've got to, in fact, look after your people. And uh, so, the transition for me will end in September, but for me that starts another phase. Uh, while I've been working half time with the city in the transition, I've started a practice with my daughter, um, and we wish to remain small. I don't want to be a big practice. I actually believe that small things are valuable. Mm. And the idea is that we can go alongside bigger consortia, other governments, and help with thought leadership and peer review and do some small projects. Mm. And uh, I've got five years to go to reach 80, so I'm not mature yet. <laughs> so you um, can still be an even better architect. <laughs> yeah. Jan, what are you up to? I've been a missionary, actually, all my professional life. <laughs> Had a vision, and then we got some evidence, and then I've spent all my energy on spreading the word and telling about what we can, how much we can do. Actually, I really feel that I have learned that as architects, we can do a lot of good things for people. And there's no reason to stop doing it just because you have a certain mm. number in your uh, birthday. Uh, so I'm continuing this missionary work. We are writing books. We are making television films. I'm doing lectures. And uh, that's what I'm doing. And uh, I'm not working with cities anymore. Um, I just keep higher up and flying over and <laughs> dropping <laughs> ideas. <laughs> I don't think that's true. I think cities are working with you. They're following those ideas. And I think that's, that's what missionaries are for. That's right. That's to convert. <laughs> and I think. 
I think the books and the movies are so important because that's about getting the message out. And it's about getting the message out to the younger generation that are coming through. So you've just been reappointed as a professor in the architectural school in Aarhus. Yes. So you are you? I think two you years. You say you're not yes. doing anything. Ah, uh, he's really. Yeah. Good. yeah um, <laughs> I, I I was thrown out of School of Architecture in Copenhagen 16 <laughs> years ago because it was too old. But now 16 <laughs> years later, they came from the other school and said, "Wouldn't I join their faculty?" So now I'm a professor once again <laughs> and working with students. <laughs> so we can keep up spreading the good words. Let's end on that note. Uh, thank you so much, both of you, for sharing your experiences and spreading the word of how we can learn to build cities for people. Um, I think it gives me great hope and also to know that you're both uh, active and uh, will continue to do so. Please, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Jan Gehl and Rob Adams.